It is a great privilege for me to be here with you today. Let's open up our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Therefore, always being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. We are not again commending ourselves to you, but are giving you an occasion to be proud of us so that you will have an answer for those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. We now, yet now, we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of your Son. We give you the praise and honor that your virtue draws from us. All things are from you and through you and unto you. Oh, dear God. So many words, so little power, so many sermons. But oh God, help us today that this might leave a mark, oh God, on eternity. Please, for the honor of your Son. For him, for him, Lord, do this thing. In Jesus' name, amen. Verse 6, Paul says, therefore, being always of good courage. People are so wrong about how God uses people. You see a man or a woman who are willing to seem to fight hell, to go anywhere at any time for the cause of Christ. You see someone with exceptional, seemingly exceptional piety or devotional life. You automatically attribute it to something within them, something about them. One time I was in, in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Peru. We were surfing. I was attempting to surf. And it was a red flag day. And I, was, I got out there and I realized I was way over my head. But I heard someone behind me coughing. It was a young man about that big. He was on a boogie board. and. I, he was drowning. And so automatically I thought, I'd go over there. And then right when I was about ready to reach his, his board road, I realized if he grabs a hold of me, he'll kill me. We'll both drown. And so I paddled over and called some surfers, about six other men. It took about 
25 minutes to get him into the coast. Those experienced surfers, they were, they were, they were scared. Now, I outweighed him by 85 pounds. On land or anywhere else, I, I could have taken him out with one arm. What was going on? In that water, he could have drowned many of us. From where did his strength come? Was it physical? No. Was it strength of will? No. What made him so dangerous, so strong? It was sheer need. He knew he had nothing. He knew he had no strength, no hope. He knew he was going to drown. He knew he was going to die. And it was that realization of his utter and absolute weakness that would have caused him to cling on to another man, a man three times his size with such strength that he would have drowned him. That is true spirituality. When you see men or women who are strong or pious or seem extraordinary, you automatically attribute it to something in them, some strength. And that's not at all the case. They have recognized their utter weakness, their utter inability to please God, their utter inability to serve God, their utter inability to stand against sin. They have absolutely nothing except the wisdom of God's Word and the power of God's Spirit, and that's what causes them to walk so close to Christ. It's not their strength, it's the recognition of their weakness. And if you sit there and say, well, I don't walk so close, maybe you have not recognized your weakness and your need of strength. I have served Him for almost four decades. Every year, I have a greater recognition of my weakness, of my inability. I have nothing. I have contributed nothing to my salvation except my sin. I have no wisdom. I have no strength. I have no power. It is only Christ and Christ alone. When you look at Paul, Peter, I think these magnificent statues and examples of faith, of discipleship. You see, for Peter to lead up that apostolic band, in God's providence, he had to fall. Or he could have never led. Peter learned that day he had nothing but the blood of Christ and the intercessory ministry of Christ. That was it. Paul, when you meet Paul in heaven, I think the first thing he will probably say to you is, why did you not believe me? Why did you not believe me when I told you I was the weakest? Do you think I was speaking in metaphor? Do you think I was just overly pietistic? Take me at my word. I really was the weakest. But you seem so strong. You don't get it. You don't understand. To the degree that God will use you, He will break you. I used to sing a song to my children when they were little and wouldn't go to sleep from Keith Green. My son, I am weak and I'm trembling. For the Lord I am always remembering. For what a strong shepherd holds you in his arm. He will break you and make you his own. The famous preacher Jowett wrote a book, School of Calvary. To the degree that God uses a man or a woman, they must suffer. And they must suffer in order to recognize their absolute need of Him. That you have 
nothing but him. And then in that weakness, God shows himself strong. Now, in verse 6, Paul says, therefore, always being always of good courage. So when we think being always of good courage, we're thinking of this manly, virile type of courage, you know, just fearlessness. I want you to think more in the terms of encouragement. I want you to think in the terms of hope. I have lived this life a long time. And I have bore with many things. And I can tell you, the greatest of all enemies is hopelessness. And hopelessness comes from either taking your eyes off the God you know or not knowing the God you should. It is hope. It is hope that every sanctified desire will be met in him. Every wound, every weakness, every sin will be done away with in him. It is that that propels a man or a woman to serve him. Therefore, being always of good courage, he says, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. What you need to understand is this is not it. This is not it. This is not the end. This is not the thing to live for. You need to recognize something. The reality is we are here and we are not yet home. We are not only not home, we are behind enemy lines. Not only are we beyond behind enemy lines, we're in a body that sometimes acts as a body of sin that fights against us. So, so don't think it like uncommon or unusual when everything, everything is coming against you. Not just from the outside, but from the inside. Not just human, but demonic. It's all coming against you. Realize you are in a war zone. This is a battle. I remember listening to a preacher one time. He was talking about someone who was telling him, you know, the devil's doing this and the devil's doing that and the devil's doing this and the devil's doing that. And he looked at him and said, that's exactly what he's supposed to be doing. That's who he is. The world's coming against me. It is supposed to. My flesh rises up against me. That's what it is. But this is not our home. This is not our ultimate reality. There is something waiting for you beyond the veil if you are in Christ that is so extraordinary, if you were to catch a glimpse of it right now, it would fracture your mind and destroy you. So yeah, I can hope. I can hold on. And go forward. One thing I try to communicate, I'm so sick and tired, it just, what's coming? I don't know the fraction of it, and what I know is an older minister, I can't even begin to communicate it, and that's the pain of the preacher. There's a limited vision of my mind, my mind from Scripture of what's coming, but even that I can't communicate to your young minds. It is so big, so glorious, it is worth dying 10,000 deaths to catch a glimpse of it. And that's what you need to see. Your problem is not that you're too passionate or too wild. The problem is you're just dead inside. You play video games. You watch other people live. You live your life vicariously. You were never supposed to do that. You were made in the image of God. And if you're a Christian, you were recreated in the image of God. What are you doing with your life? To go on with him, to serve him, to love him. 
It's, it's not a morbid trail of tears. I, I, I love what Michael Card writes. There is a joy in the journey. There's a light we can love on the way. There is a wonder and wildness to life and freedom for those who obey. That's what I'm talking about. I was telling the class previously, I said, if I was standing before all the professors of every Ivy League school in New England, and they said, give us an evidence of God, the, the thing I would tell them is my dissatisfaction. If I was evolved, if I simply evolved, I would have no dissatisfaction. I would have no sense that there's something out there that I was made for that is not now. And it causes me to long for it. To dream about it. Not a church service, but a new creation. Paul had this magnificent cosmic view of the new creation. A magnificent, glorious view of the reigning Christ. The beauty, the joy unspeakable and full of glory. And that is the thing that drove him. Therefore, he says, being always of good courage. But I'm also recognizing that this is a matter of hope. I'm still in this body. I'm away from the Lord. I'm away from my home. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. He says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith. Faith. Uh, just let me for a moment. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I can turn this into an absurdity if taken out of context. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I've always hoped to fly. Unaided, to fly. So faith means I have the assurance that I can, well, I, I think I can fly. So I go up to the top of this building and I jump off. I have the assurance I can fly and I act on it. Is that faith? Conviction of things not seen. I've never seen anyone fly, never but I have the conviction that I can. And so I climb up the building and I jump off again and I die. Is that faith? No, that's presumption. Faith is an absolute impossibility apart from the revelation of God. Faith is an absolute impossibility apart from knowing what God has said in the scriptures. Do not kid yourself. Faith is not some philosophical leap into darkness. It's not even some philosophical leap into an undefined light. Faith is standing upon what God said. And the only way you're going to make it through this Christian life, the only way you're going to be able to serve Him as He ought to be served is if literally, like John Bunyan, when they cut you, you bleed the Bible. It's the Word of God. And not just the principles of an ethic. Christianity has an ethic, but it is far more than an ethic and a morality. It is a person. It is a relationship. It is life. It is life. We walk by faith. And as you grow older, and as you know God in His Word. And as you experience His providences, I can assure you that little by little, the world, this world, starts to fade a bit. The other side of the veil becomes clear. Scripture Scripture. Don't tell me that you're like the man on the surfboard and you're utterly dependent upon Christ if you're not utterly dependent upon Christ's Scripture. 
For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. There it is again. I want you to know that the greatest battle that I believe you'll have as a Christian is discouragement, discouragement, discouragement. And the only way to triumph, not tolerate, but triumph over that is the Word of God and communion with God in prayer. Remember this always. The greatest ministers of Christ were not only excellent theologians, they were men of prayer. Bethany said of Martin Lloyd-Jones, you'll never understand my husband as an evangelist if you do not first understand him as a man of prayer. Whitfield was a man of prayer. Wesley was a man of prayer. Amy Carmichael was a woman of prayer. We have a lot of young theologians today are little more than parrots repeating what they have not experienced, but what's been taught them. If your theology is going to become real, it's going to become real on your knees. In prayer. He says, we are of good courage, and I say, prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Here is a man who had caught a glimpse, a glimpse of Christ. He had caught a glimpse of future glory. And that is what propelled him. He longed for it. He longed for it. You're going to learn sooner or later, students, listen to me, that there, if you are, this is a Puritan saying, if you are truly converted, then your heart has been enlarged in such a fashion that if you were to gain the whole world, it would leave you empty, and if you were to lose the whole world, it would affect you not. And I can tell you, young people, you, you, can, you can even in the ministry have success and it will not satisfy you. You can marry the most beautiful woman, the most brilliant man. It will not satisfy you. If you are a Christian, I hear people say all the time, you know, your husband compliments you, your wife compliments you. If it, your husband fulfills you, your husband completes you, your wife completes you. If your husband or your wife can complete you, you're lost. You're not a Christian. Only Christ can complete you. And furthermore, if you put that burden on another human, your marriage is going to fall apart. No one can satisfy you. Your heart's too big. But know this, you can even be in a good school, but if you're not practicing personal devotion, that bigness of heart, even if you're a true believer, will start to shrivel some. Paul was inflamed with what was coming. so far beyond what your little brackets have created. It's not clouds and harps. It's not eternal church services. It's life and joy. and completely sanctified wildness. And it's what propels us, or should propel us. He says in verse 9, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. Now, I want to give you two lights to motivate you. And I want you to understand that just like in creation, there was a greater light and a lesser light. I'm going to give you a greater light and a lesser light. And I'm going to give you the lesser light first. What? You know, we always see someone who's converted, you know, and for the first six months, they're like a wild man or a wild woman. They are just running everywhere, witnessing and talking about Christ and wanting to risk it all. But what does it take? For that to not only continue on to grow, into the 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s until death. What can make an old man more passionate about the Christian life than when he was a young man and newly converted? I'm going to show you, first of all, the lesser light. He says in verse 9, Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him.
everyone in heaven, all they do is thinking about, they think about pleasing Christ. And they do please Christ. And you may say to yourself, I can't wait to get there. No, no, no. Paul says, I want that now. I want to be pleasing to Christ now. And he said, it's my ambition. You see, so many people have this idea that when they become a Christian, they should lose all ambition. No. You should have more ambition than anyone on this planet. It's just ambition for the right thing. There was a text I shared with the class. Listen to it. If, if I changed it a little bit, kept faithfulness to the Greek, but changed it just a little bit so it would be difficult to recognize and did not give a bunch of preachers the text I was citing, they would think I was quoting from some Spartan manual. He says, who will render to each person according to their deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. Have you ever looked at your Christian life that way? You see athletes just fighting for, you know, you see boxers and baseball players and this and that and Olympians. You see people chasing after wealth and they're just chasing and chasing and chasing. It's their ambition, their ambition. Paul was ambitious. He was far more ambitious than any secular mind you could ever imagine. But he was ambitious. He was seeking for glory, honor, and immortality before Christ. To stand before him one day knowing. Like C.T. Studd when his daughter visited him. And he went into the little hut where he was living. She had visited him and she was now newly married. And he sees her and he runs into the hut. And he, and he comes out. And he looks a little distraught and he said, I, I, I went in my hut to give, um, to, I wanted to give you something for your wedding, but I gave everything to Christ years ago. I don't have anything. Can you imagine? Think about it, men. Some of you want to stand on podiums and you want to be honored here and there. Think about it. Standing. Being able to stand because of his blood, because of his justification. Be able to stand before him. And he looks at you. He looks at you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? He looks at you. And he says, well done. Well done. Well, what, else, what else you want? What do you, what? Well done. Well done. Well done. Really? <laughs> Yeah, well done. And of course, we, we all know what's going on there. He knows, I know, that if there was any well done, it was he who did it. <laughs> he's, such a grace, he's such a gracious God. He tells you to do something, he does it through you, and then rewards you for it. This is a win-win. So, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't, I can't figure out theologically, and I'm not sure anyone else can, how this actually works. Because you will lose your mind if you look in the mirror of God's Word and you see yourself as you are, and you think that you would be judged in any way with regard to your works. We have to look at this passage knowing that we stand before God perfect, not just forgiven, but righteous because of the life and death and resurrection of His Son. We must look at this passage in light of that as believers, and yet somehow as believers we will stand before Him and be judged and rewarded. And I don't know how that works, but I can sleep at night because of this. Not because of me or my ministry, but because of him and his ministry. 
And we must hold these things in attention that we are responsible for the grace that has been given to us. We are responsible. You are responsible. And the greater the gift, the greater the responsibility. And you need to think about that. Not just lost people need to think about the judgment. But we need to think. I mean, really. Think about it. Let's say you're, you're the most beautiful person physically that ever walked the planet. That's going to last until what? You're 30 and then it's just straight downhill from there. You're, you're, the greatest, you're the greatest athlete in the world. And one day, you know, someone will have to help you go to the bathroom. You're a wealthy man and you die and you rot in the ground. Is that what you want? Are you really that dead? Is that what you want? Or do you want this eternal thing? You give a cup of cold water and you'll not lose your reward forever. It is eternal. It's an eternal king, an eternal kingdom. I see all these people fighting about politics and I suppose that's important to some degree. But it's all for no matter what happens, if a good regime comes, it will then be countered by another that's bad and, and eventually the whole thing goes downhill. And if you don't believe it, study history. I mean, there are men, and I praise God for them, who built the country, died for the country and everything, but the country's going to be lost sooner or later. You can't even live for countries because it's temporal. You live for a kingdom that knows no end, that glory only increases. It doesn't fade. Heaven and the new earth, they're not static. They're dynamic. We go from glory to glory. So one of the great motivations is, yes, I will, I will give an account for my gifts. Not just spiritual gifts, talents. I teach my boys when they were little, I would go, one. And this is what they would say. If we're strong, we've been made strong to help the weak. Two, if we have had the opportunity of an education, we help those of our brothers who have no opportunity. Three, if we have wealth, it is for our brothers who have none. This is why we live. Our gifts, our talents, our opportunities. You think when you fluff off in a class, you're just fluffing off on a class? No. No. You are despising privilege. Not that a professor gave you or even your parents gave you. That Christ gave you. Do you see that? So what is one of the great motivations? It is a solemn motivation that we will stand before the judgment throne of Christ. We'll be held accountable for our gifts, for our talents, for our opportunities, for our privileges. But now there's a greater a greater light. We can't obviously preach this entire text, but there's a greater light that eclipses the one that I just gave you. That was the moon. Now we're going to look at the sun. Paul says in verse 14, for the love of Christ controls us. We are so in our flesh. We're so humanistic. So many people will look at this text and say, oh yes, Paul's great love for Christ controlled him. I don't believe that's what Paul is saying. I believe it was Christ's great love for Paul that controlled him. When I look in the mirror at my love for Christ, I don't see a lot of motivation. I see me up here and zealous. I see me down here and not zealous. I see me full of love, apathetic. I see me cold, hot. I see all kinds of things. I see no consistency. And so if I was basing my encouragement upon that, I'd have no constant encouragement. But what is the encouragement? It is not my love for Christ, my piety toward Christ. What is my encouragement? Christ's love for me. 
oh my, I've gone, I'm so sorry, I've gone beyond. Let, let me just, look, this is so important for you to understand. I know that on the internet I'm known as the, the meanest human being who ever lived. This is what I've always known. The greatest need of the Christian is to comprehend your greatest need. Your greatest need is to comprehend how much Christ loves you. Do you really think he did all this so that the first time you look at him, there's a scowl on his face? You need to understand, He will be more joyful to see you than you will be to see Him. He finished all that. And I want you to know that it isn't judgment. It isn't condemnation. It isn't that He's going to frown. That is not my motivation. No. That will kill you. There is some medicine, there's a medicine that is so much stronger. It is coming to a greater and greater understanding of the love of God. And the more you understand how much God loves you in Christ and what He did for you through His Son, if you would just grow in that, everything else would take its place. It's not how much you love Him. It's how much He loves you. And as you grow in that and you see it, it begins to take hold of your life and you become a prisoner. You have no place to go but to Him. Not because, oh, you love Him so much. It's because He loves you so much. If you see a man who is extraordinary in his love for his wife, extraordinary, what do you say? What do you do? How do you respond to that? You go, oh, what an amazing man, don't you? You're so silly and blind. You're missing the point. You see, maybe he's not extraordinary at all. Maybe he's even less than normal. But what you're seeing The cause of this passion in his life is not that he's extraordinary. It's that his wife's extraordinary. And her extraordinary beauty and virtue draws out of this ordinary man, or even subordinary man, an extraordinary devotion. D do you see what I'm talking about? I've tried to study people throughout history, you know, on both sides. I mean, you know, evangelicals, pietists, Calvinists, Arminians. And when I put them all together and I find within those circles groups of men and women who love Christ in an extraordinary fashion, I see all of them as very extremely weak and subpar. But they had an extraordinary vision of the love of God in Christ with regard to the cross. Oh, students, I wish to be with you for so long and to beat you over the head with this. If you will chase it down, if you will chase down, if you will mine for it, as in Job 28, if you'll turn over mountains, if you'll go down into the deep, if you'll dam up rivers, if you take your pickaxe and you keep going and going and you begin to see the love of God in Christ, the motivation issue is not so much a problem anymore. Now, being young, the problem will be a wisdom issue. But there will be motivation. You don't need to think about becoming a better you. Because you could do all that in the flesh. You need to think great thoughts of Him by studying Him. Not just Christian principles. Him, look for Him. I want to see the King in all His beauty. I want to see Him. Make that your passion. And the missionary stuff, the world vision, the piety, everything, that will follow suit. Let's pray. Father, thank You. 
Lord, so limited. Please help these students. Please help them. In Jesus' name, amen.